Welcome back to Invested, I'm Lockie, and today we'll get Intel stock, the semiconductor giant that has been struggling over the past year. Over the past one year, the stock is down over 7.38%, but over the past five days alone, the stock has fallen 6.02% in value, so with a notable pullback in the price of Intel recently, the question naturally becomes, is the stock now undervalued, and is there a buying opportunity present? Well, today, I'm going to be answering that for you. I'm going to be breaking down the business, focusing on all the key factors. It's financial strength, profitability, growth to management, then give you a current valuation and price target for the stock going forward, telling you if Intel is a buy, hold, or sell at this time. If you enjoy this type of content, then please drop us a like down below, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and let's get into it. So opening up our screener here, we're going to start off by assessing the financial strength of Intel. How financially strong is Intel as a company, and how likely is it that Intel can endure a financial downturn going forward? Well, if we come down here and have a look at the financial strength metrics, and of course, when assessing the financial strength of any large company, there's really one key metric we focus on, and that is the cash to debt ratio. The cash the business currently has on hand to meet their short-term and long-term debts outstanding. And the current cash debt ratio of Intel is 0.86, indicating that for every dollar of debt on the company's balance sheet, they only have 86 cents in cash to meet that debt obligation not the most advantageous financial position. It means that Intel can only pay down 86% of their debt outstanding before needing to look to additional operational cash flows to supplement their debt repayments on both an interest and principal based level going forward. So not the most favorable cash to debt ratio, but what some investors may be missing with Intel is the massive amounts of free cash flow being generated by Intel's core operations on a daily and monthly basis. Intel is a massively free cash flow generative business, bringing consistent cash flows from their chip sales, and that cash flow leaves the company with the ability not only to pay down those debt obligations, but also reinvest and re-stimulate growth in other areas of their business. So despite the seemingly unfavorable cash to debt ratio, by virtue of these massive cash flows flowing in from operations, Intel is actually in a fairly strong financial position. This great degree of financial strength is accentuated by the fairly high Altman score the company has been assigned. The company has been assigned an almost score of 3.34, indicating a fair degree of safety with the business and a low degree of risk in the event of a financial downturn. In the event of a financial pullback, Intel is well positioned with a fair degree of cash on hand and consistent cash flows flowing in from operations, enabling them not only to endure a downturn, but also reinvest and re-stimulate growth through opportunistic acquisitions and organic growth coming out of a pullback. So on a financial strength basis, by virtue of those massive cash flows, Intel is actually in a fairly good financial position. But that's simply the financial strength of Intel. Now, let's have a look at profitability. Let's see how profitable Intel is as a business. So we come over here to profitability, and of course, when assessing the profitability of any large company, there's really four key things we focus on. Number one is the operating margins, number two, the net margins, number three, the returns on equity, and number four, the returns on assets. So we come down here and start off with the margins. You can see operating margins of 9.31% and net margins of 26.89%. Exceptional. These margins are absolutely fantastic. Net margins of around 27% indicate that for every dollar of revenue that comes into Intel's business, they retain about 27% of that as pure profit a high degree of profitability. And although these margins may not be as high as some other semiconductor companies, you look at a company like Nvidia with net margins of around 35%, or a company like TSMC with net margins of around 40%. Although these margins aren't as high as some other semiconductor firms, they're still absolutely fantastic and are indicative of a great degree of profitability. And when considering that Intel is a $200 billion company, to be maintaining net margins of 27%, is absolutely fantastic. Very, very impressive margins on both an industry basis and historically for the company. And on a net margins basis alone, Intel is a very attractive company from a profitability standpoint. But now let's have a look at returns on equity and returns on assets to get an idea of how Intel's management are allocating their capital. So we come down here to returns on equity and returns on assets. And of course, when assessing a wonderful business, we typically look for returns on equity and returns on assets around 20%. So now let's see what Intel is producing. Returns on equity of 25.69% and returns on assets of 13.68%. So of course that returns on equity figure is outstanding. Returns on equity of 25.69% is exceeding our 20% threshold and indicates not only a great degree of underlying quality in Intel's business model, but also a great degree of management competency. The management of Intel clearly know how to allocate capital well to make high returns on equity, and that's evident within these figures here. Very, very impressive. And although the returns on assets figure is nowhere near as high as this number, returns on assets of only 13.68%, also well below our 20% threshold, this is still understandable given the underlying nature of Intel's business. Intel is naturally a capital intensive business where a large degree of capital infrastructure and marginal cost investment is required to expand the business and grow it going forward, and thus fairly low returns on assets are made relative to their returns on equity. This is absolutely understandable and I have no concerns at all. If these slightly lower returns on assets were to perpetuate going forward over the next 10 years, if they were to continue to get returns on assets around 14 to 15% over the next
next 10 to 15 years, that would be absolutely fine for me from a profitability standpoint, given the underlying nature of their core operations. So on a profitability basis, by virtue of healthy margins, impressive returns on equity, and understandable returns on assets, on a profitability basis, Intel is doing fairly well. So on a financial strength basis, they're well positioned by virtue of massive cash flows flowing into their operation, and on a profitability basis, they're fairly attractive. But now let's get an idea of how much Intel is worth as a business. Because although it may be a fairly good company, if it's not trading at a fair valuation, then buying into the stock right now could lead to losses in the short to medium term. So let's come down here and have a look at some basic valuation ranks. And of course, when assessing a business based upon these basic valuation ranks, there's a lot of different metrics we can use to assess the business. We've got the quick ratio, cash ratio, PB ratio, PS ratio, all these different fancy, fancy ratios. But when it comes to assessing a business utilizing these simple ratios, there's really only one I use, and it's the PE ratio. The price? to earnings ratio. And the current price to earnings ratio for Intel is 9.95, indicating a very, very low degree of growth assumption priced into the stock going forward. Investors in the broader market believe that Intel will grow at a fairly slow rate going forward over the next 10 to 15 years. Growth rates are around 5 to 10% on earnings per share basis and free cash flow basis going forward over the next decade. And thus, this very, very low PE has been assigned. With such a low PE assigned to the company, naturally, some investors have made the assertion that the company is now undervalued. Whether or not this low PE indicates the company is over or undervalued is up for debate. What we are going to do later on is run a full DCF analysis, breaking down the company's earnings per share and free cash flow on a more granular level to give you a clearer picture of exactly how much the company is worth and exactly how much you should be paying per share for the business. So keep watching for that one. But before we get started on our DCF analysis, I want to break down some basic financial data associated with Intel. So if we come down here, we can see the revenue and net income for Intel between 2009 and 2020. You can see back in 2009, revenue was around 35,127 and net income of 4,369. And then in 2020, revenue of 77,867 and net income of 20,899. So you can see a very low degree of growth over the past decade. Very, very low growth, but that's indicative of the mature company, which Intel certainly is. A very mature, entrenched business no longer compounding its revenues at an exponential rate, and it's exactly what we'd be expecting to see from a business of Intel's nature. This isn't an AMD, this isn't Nvidia, this isn't growing rapidly, this is simply compounding its revenues consistently over time, making consistent returns for shareholders. And when analyzing a mature investment, this is actually fairly attractive. It indicates the management of Intel have been allocating capital well over the past decade to stimulate consistent revenue growth within the business, fairly consistent net income over that time as well. Very attractive from a mature investment prospect. Coming over here to the cash to debt ratio of the company over time, and we can see a fairly similar flatlining trend. We can see a similar amount of cash on hand for Intel over the past decade. Back in 2009, cash on hand was around 13,920 and debt on hand of 2,221. And then in 2020, cash on hand of 23,895 and debt of 36,401. So the key trend here is, of course, more and more debt being employed on Intel's balance sheet over time. Starting back in 2016, debt actually exceeded cash on their balance sheet for the first time. The debt on their balance sheet has continued to exceed their cash on hand going forward all the way to 2020. So massive and massive amounts of debt being employed by the company relative to their cash. And for some investors, they may feel as if this creates a degree of leverage risk with the business. That Intel is employing too much debt and that in the event of a financial downturn, Intel may not be sufficiently positioned to both endure that downturn and pay down those debts whilst making opportunistic acquisitions during an ideal time. With so much debt on hand, Intel may be stuck in place effectively paying down those debts rather than being able to expand it. The way I see it, however, this isn't the case at all. Intel has massive amounts of free cash flow coming in from their operations consistently, and thus has more than enough free cash flow in hand to both pay down these debt obligations and continue to reinvest and expand their operations. Despite this large amount of debt on their balance sheet, these free cash flows offset that debt-related risk and leave the company in a fairly agile financial position. They still have enough cash on hand to pay down 86% of their debt outstanding, and then to use those additional operational cash flows to supplement the rest of those debt payments and then expand their operations going forward. So on a financial strength basis, I have very very, very little concern with Intel. Coming down here to returns on capital, you can see fairly consistent returns on capital over the past decade of a fairly low nature, once again indicative of that mature business. Returns on capital around this kind of low teens to high single digit figure range for most of the past decade. We had a jump up in returns on capital in 2010 and 2011, and then a drop off in 2018, then a drop off in 2017, which is understandable given the overall struggles within the semiconductor industry that year. But by and large, very consistent returns on capital over the past decade, once more indicative of that mature business, just creating consistent returns for investors, no giant jumps in returns on capital over time as we might see with a growing business. If these moderate returns on capital around a kind of 12 to 13% were to continue going forward over the next decade, I would be absolutely fine with that as an investor. Given the mature nature of Intel as an operation, I, under I completely understand these lower returns on capital, and they would be absolutely adequate going forward over the next 10 years. So that's some basic financial data associated with Intel, the PE ratio to give you an idea of what the business may be worth, and also some profitability and financial strength data to give you an idea of how the business is performing. But if we really want to understand what Intel is worth as a company, and how much we should be paying for each individual share of the business, then we'd have to run something called a DCF analysis, a discounted cash flow analysis. 
And as Warren Buffett always says, the value of any business is the cash flow that it will return to its shareholders between now and Judgment Day. And that's exactly what a DCF tells us. We're going to run a DCF on both an earnings per share basis and a free cash flow basis to give us an idea of how much earnings the company is bringing in and how much of that is translating to free cash flow the company can actually use to expand and grow their operations going forward. So if we come down here, we're going to start off on an earnings per share basis. And if we come down here, we can see the earnings per share growth rates over the past 10, 5, and 1 year period. Over the past 10 years, it's been around 9%, 5 years, 22%. In the past 1 year, a growth rate of only 1% on an earnings per share basis. Now, do I believe this exceptionally low 1% growth rate will perpetuate going forward over the next 10 years? Do I believe Intel is only going to grow at 1% annually going forward over the next 10 years or so? Absolutely not. I think this growth rate is far, far too low. And it's more indicative of the reallocation of capital within Intel's business over the past year, rather than a consistent earnings rate going forward. Given the overall maturity of Intel's business and their attempts to re-stimulate growth going forward over the next decade, I believe a more reasonable growth rate for Intel going forward over the next 10 years would be somewhere in between the 10 and 5 year growth rate for the company. So taking those numbers into account, I believe a 12% growth rate for Intel going forward over the next decade would be reasonable given the existing maturity of the business and their attempts to reinvigorate growth going forward over the next decade. As we've recently seen with their $20 billion founder investment, they're taking major steps to reinvigorate growth within their business, building out their capital infrastructure to perpetuate meaningful growth going forward over the next decade. And thus, I believe a 12% growth rate going forward over the next 10 years would be justified for the company on an earnings per share basis. So we're going to utilize a growth rate of 12% going forward over the next decade with our discount rate of 8%. 8% of course is the long run return of the stock market, and thus a fair rate at which to discount our cash flows. Then our earnings per share figure of $5.15, taken down here for a 12 month trailing basis, we come up to a fair value price tag for Intel of $123.80, signifying a massive degree of potential short-term upside for the stock, and that Intel is trading well, well below its intrinsic value at present. Based upon our earnings per share price target, it appears as if investors can more than double their money on Intel stock at the current trading price. And thus, Intel poses an exceptionally advantageous opportunity for both value investors and long-term growth investors. The company appears to be trading well, well below its intrinsic value, and thus a very advantageous buying opportunity. But that's simply an earnings per share valuation. Now, let's have a look at a free cash flow valuation to give us an idea of how much those earnings are translating to free cash flow the company can actually use to expand and grow their operations going forward. So if we switch over to free cash flow, if we come down here, we can see the free cash flow growth rates over the past 10, 5, and 1 year period. Over the past 10 years, it's been around 9.6%. 5 years, 16.1%. For the past one year, a decline in free cash flow as they've reallocated their cash flows within the business, a decline of 10.7%. Now, once more, do I believe this declining free cash flow growth rate is going to continue going forward over the next decade? Absolutely not. I think this growth rate is more indicative of a one time reallocation of cash flow rather than consistent declines of cash flow on their balance sheet going forward over the next 10 years. And thus, once again, I believe given the existing maturity of Intel as a business, but also the prospects of increased growth going forward, I believe once again, I believe an 11 to 12% free cash flow rate of growth going forward over the next 10 years would be justified for the business once more. Given the massive amounts of free cash flow already accretive on Intel's balance sheet, it's a very, very mature business, and thus there's massive amounts of cash flow already present on their balance sheet, we're going to utilize a slightly lower growth rate relative to our earnings per share growth rate utilized within the previous calculation. And thus we're going to utilize growth rate of 11% on a free cash flow basis going forward over the next 10 years. So utilizing our growth rate of 11% on a free cash flow basis going forward over the next decade, once again with our discount rate of 8%, then our free cash flow per share figure of $4.23 taken down here for 12 month trailing basis, we come up to a slightly lower price target of Intel of $94.74, signifying still a massive degree of undervaluation in the stock at present, and that the stock is trading well, well below its intrinsic value. On a free cash flow basis, once again, Intel provides an advantageous opportunity for both value investors and long-term growth investors. So as you can see on both an earnings per share basis and a free cash flow basis, it appears as if Intel is trading meaningfully below its intrinsic value. But which of these valuations makes more sense for the company? Which of these valuations gives us a better idea of exactly how much the company is worth and exactly how much we should be paying per share for the business? Well, given the existing maturity of Intel as a business, I believe it would be more advantageous to value the company on a free cash flow basis rather than an earnings per share basis. Given investors and the market's tendency more broadly to value mature companies based upon their free cash flow growth rather than their earnings per share growth, I believe a free cash flow valuation will give us a better idea of exactly how much the company is worth at this time. And thus, we're going to utilize my free cash flow price target as my current price target for the company. And thus, my current price target for Intel is going to be $94.74 signifying still a massive, massive degree of potential short-term upside. From the current trading price, investors stand to almost double their money on the stock. So a massive, massive opportunity in Intel right now, advantageous for both value investors and long-term growth investors looking to pick up a wonderful business trading below its intrinsic value and hold for long-term as the business reinvigorates growth. Going forward, despite the underperformance of Intel over the past five years or so, I believe over the long-term, given its recent steps to reinvigorate growth within their business, they have a fairly favorable long-term growth runway going forward. As they continue to invest strategically and reinvigorate growth within key businesses, business units within their operation, going forward I believe the business can perpetuate meaningful growth going forward over the next decade, 
and thus deliver impressive returns and potential market outperformance to investors. Given the favorable steps Intel's management have been taking and the massive discount to its intrinsic value the company currently trades at, for me right now, Intel stock is a buy. So that was my brief yet somewhat detailed analysis of Intel stock, a company with outstanding financial strength by virtue of a healthy amount of cash in hand and consistent cash flows flowing in from their operations, profitability of an impressive degree with outstanding net margins and operating margins of around 25-27%, to 27%, returns on equity that are outstanding around 26%, and understandable returns on assets of around 14%. The business appears to be trading well, well below its intrinsic value and thus creates an advantageous buying opportunity for both value investors and long-term growth investors. The company is clearly taking steps to reinvigorate growth within their business, re-establishing them as a leading player within the industry and thus taking into account the recent $20 billion foundry investment in combination with the massive discount to the intrinsic value the company is currently trading at. For me right now, Intel stock is a buy. If you enjoyed this video, if you learned something more about Intel as a company or as a stock, then please drop us a like down below, hit subscribe if you haven't already. If there's a company you want me to talk about in the next video, then please just comment down below and I'll see if I can get onto it. But until then, thank you and I'll see you in the next one.